Kia te whānau o Ihukaraiti ko Andrew Double Day Hall. Welcome. Today we're looking at the Gospel text for Sunday the 4th of June 2023. It's an extremely well-known text. It's Matthew chapter 28 verses 16 through to 20. The thing that we know of is the Great Commission. This is part of Matthew's rather brief resurrection narrative. So we pick it up in Matthew 28 verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. I found myself sitting with this passage and asking a question. Did he really say that? Did he say it like that? Because it sounds kind of odd. It sounds kind of un-Jesus-like. There's a kind of blech. There's no warmth, there's no sense of intro and exit. It's just a kind of mission statement -y kind of thing. Just, boom, put it out there. And who talks like that? I don't think that Jesus did. And as I spent some time surveying his pre- and post-resurrection narratives concerning th his interactions with people, there's nothing really that's quite like this thing that we know of as the Great Commission. It's like he gets straight down to business, then that's it. Now here's the thing. Matthew says very little about what happens after Jesus rises from the dead. It's all there in 20 verses of Matthew chapter 28. Nothing much. And the thing that struck me is that he would have known more about it than just about anybody. Probably similar to John, but of the gospel writers, he was one that was there. He, <laughs> he witnessed the whole thing. And yet he actually says very little. He doesn't talk about the appearances of Mary Magdalene and the other women in the morning. He doesn't talk, I don't think he does. He doesn't talk about the appearance of the risen Christ to Simon Peter. Or to the two on the road to Emmaus. Doesn't talk about the appearance that evening in the upper room to the ten and the others who happened to be present. He doesn't talk about the appearance of the risen Christ a week later to the ten plus Thomas and others who happened to be present. He doesn't talk about the appearance to his own brother James or to the 500 who Paul tells us were gathered in one place at one time and all experienced him, all people who were followers of Jesus. He doesn't say anything about it. He doesn't talk about the appearances in Galilee apart from this one. He doesn't mention the fireside breakfast meeting that Jesus had with that small number of disciples, half a dozen of them that went fishing in the morning where Peter is officially repatriated and publicly restored to his role of leadership. He says nothing about that. He doesn't reference the numerous appearances of Jesus to individuals and groups over the nearly 40 days 
between his resurrection and his ascension just before Pentecost. He would have known these things better, I would suggest, than just about anyone. But he doesn't talk about them. And it struck me that, as I said at the beginning, the words that Matthew puts in Jesus' mouth, because I think that's what he's doing, lacks the sheer human warmth of the Christ of the both pre- and post-crucifixion resurrection that we have come to know and to experience. Instead, it seems to me that he gives a potted summary of the things that Jesus said that oriented his disciples outward toward the world, toward the whole world. He just gathered the bits and put them all together in one place in a potted summary. And I just wondered if it, it feels to me almost as if Matthew was sitting at a desk pondering what he wanted to say about the risen Christ, knowing that others, many others, would write stuff and would tell the stories of their experiences and of the experiences of others that they had heard about, that there would be much that would be written and recorded. And he's asking himself one simple question. What's the most, the one most important thing that I could say about my experience of the risen Christ? What's the most important thing that the church needs to hear as the future unfolds? What's the one thing that I can say. And this is it. This is what Matthew is called to say. We call it the Great Commission. Now, the truth is that you find it in the other Gospels. It's in bits and pieces, but it's there. It's basically there. Yet here we have it in one place. It's succinct. It's pared down. It's clear and it's focused. And there's much that I could say about it. But I'm not going to. There are numerous paths that I could pursue. But this is a short message and time doesn't permit. And you'll have heard much of it before anyway. So what I'm wanting to do, this is the bit that is surprising perhaps, is to focus on what Matthew has just done. Matthew, I want to suggest, has made what he saw to be the main thing, the main thing. He's cut out all that is extraneous, all that could possibly be a distraction. And he's left us with a simple, bare bones instruction that, as I've said before a number of times, we call the Great Commission. And this has informed the church down through the centuries. It has been something the church has picked up and run with, sometimes with greater and sometimes with less enthusiasm. But it's been held there as a, mission, as, a, as a kind of central core call upon the church as it engages with the world. Matthew has done this with a razor-sharp clarity of focus. And he offers us a model for our own lives. We live complex lives in a world that is full of increasing novelty. Don't you notice it? We have and we face a exponentially growing number of distractions and opportunities to do things that we would never have imagined even five years ago. And they're not all bad. Many are good or great or wonderful. The question needs to be, are they our main thing? 
Are they the thing that God is calling us to do? Us to be? Us to focus on and to respond to? Stephen Covey was uh, an, an author. He was a, a, management guru, a leadership and management guru. He was, um, he was wise and clever. His, probably his first and best known book was called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Interesting, later he wrote another book because he discovered another habit, an eighth habit. But this is a very good book. And he went on to write others and provide a lot of insight. And there's a book that I found very helpful, which is based on the seven habits, and it's called First Things First. It encourages us to be clear and focused, just like Matthew was, to make the first things, to put first things first, to make the main thing, the main thing, and in a sense to fulfill our purpose. Because when we do that, it enables to, us to live with a measure of purpose. I was uh, reminded as I was reflecting on this of Rick Warren, who many will know of, a famous um, mega church pastor who talks about this, who, who's very clearly focused on the question of purpose of why we're here, why you're here, why I'm here. Each of us has a divinely appointed purpose in his view, and I'm inclined to agree. Sometimes it takes a while for it to emerge and to become apparent. Well, what he does is he references King David in Acts chapter 13 and 36. It says that David, when he had served God's purpose in his generation, he fell asleep. When he had served God's purpose, he fulfilled the reason that he was here. And that was it. And it's okay. It was okay. And so the question is, for you, for me, what is your main thing? What is your first thing? The thing that is, in fact, the most important. And you might say, I have no idea. Because I think it's a fairly common response. Because it's something that you haven't thought about. You just get up in the morning and you respond to what's in front of you each day. But I want to suggest that within us, the answer lies already. It's in there, and it may be buried deep, but it's there. And I found that Covey helped me find an answer for myself. And what he does, and first things first, is he provides a number of strategies to be able to, to dig down, to discover what it is for us that's really important that helps us to peer back the things that are peripheral and aren't necessary for us so that we can focus more intentionally on the things that are important to make our first thing our first thing. And the strategy that I found most helpful, it may not work for you, but it's certainly helped for me, is that he invites us to imagine a funeral, our own. And imagine ourselves to be a kind of fly on the wall listening to what's said about us. And asking ourselves the question, is this how I want to be remembered? Is this how I want to be remembered? And even as I'm just talking now, this is not scripted. I'm, remi- scripted. I'm reminded of a, of a, of a story of a, of a well-known man who... Um, was on business in a foreign city and he gets up in the morning he's staying in a hotel he gets up in the morning and he goes to the door and opens it to pick up the newspaper and he's shocked to read his own obituary and it has this huge headline it says dynamite king dies and he reads through it and is appalled by what he reads And he realizes that his main legacy, he will be remembered as a person who invented dynamite, this instrument of death. And his life profoundly changed from that moment. 
And he really gets remembered as that. He gets remembered for something else. Who was he? Alfred Nobel, who has given the Nobel Peace Prize. He didn't want to be remembered for that, but want to be remembered for something different. And we're being offered a similar kind of opportunity. How do you want to be remembered? You may think, well, I'm really quite old. It's never too late to start making changes, to becoming this kind of person that you want to be remembered as. What strategies do you need to put in place? What things need to change in your life? What habits might need to be attended to? in order for you to become the kind of person that you want to be remembered as, the kind of person who is, in the end, fulfilling God's purpose in your life. Matthew, it seemed to me, made the main thing the main thing. As best as he could, he put first things first. And in an odd little way, we're being encouraged to do the same. God bless you. Amen.